So we're going to put together a pole barn right in this location. We're going to show you how we do it, and it all happens right here, right now. The building is going to be 12 deep and 24 long. A 12 by 12 enclosure for Donnie Boy and a 12 by 12 shed roof open structure for storing hay and the like. To get that started and to get everything square from the outset, I'm going to take some strapping or what people call furring strips and I'm going to build a template. So I just scab them together, eight foot sections with four foot mending pieces. Whack them together with a couple screws. line behind me is three feet, three, four, the diagonal when this is square and a true 90 should read five feet. Somebody call Pythagoras. I like a number eight by inch and five eighths gold coat washer head for this. I feel like, especially with these twisted pieces of strapping, that I get a better bite and a better lock, and I don't drive the screw head through the wood, making getting it out later maybe a little more difficult. I reuse these screws all the time. I'll reuse this strapping, and I don't have to worry about string here, so tripping over it, knocking over a stake, any of that. Once this is in place, I know exactly where my post holes go and exactly where to dig them. At least that's the theory. We'll see when we get up to the roof. That's when you really find out if it's worth all this effort now. In the meantime, it looks like we have four reasonably square corners. Another thing I like washer head screws for is combining them with a brightly colored tape as a marker for my post hole locations. So what I do is I lay out the post location. In this case, I'm just using a gauge block off my struts. Puncture the tape with the screw, put the screw on my mark, so then later when I come back with a shovel or a machine and I move this entire template, it doesn't weigh very much. The template goes, but the post hole locations stay. Very handy. My fix it up life here with the Flex Seal family of products. Before I move the jig, I'm gonna make big wide marks to delineate my corners. That way, when there's a machine in here or we're digging and we've got piles of dirt, way out here, I still have points of reference so later on I can connect the dots and get the posts right where I want them. That's the idea. I always wanted to do an infomercial. We've got our corner posts in. And if you're doing this on your own, if you get one post plumb and you're trying to gauge the other one, you can just sort of eyeball. And when they get parallel with each other, if one plumb, one is plumb, the other's plumb. We've got our post protectors locked in. And before I went any further, I wanted to just point up that we used the layout grid to locate 
and mark our intermediate posts. There's one, there's one, there's two more over there. This side is the horse stall. This side is what amounts to a tractor shed for supplies. And before we strip the template, we put in angle braces, again, reusing the strapping or furring strips. Then we're gonna backfill the holes, overfilling them a little. And the next step is to get the machine, once it's free of the template, and drill these new post holes and stitch it all together. This is the end of day two. We've got four posts, the corner posts that connect everything together in the ground. We've laid out, excavated, and poured concrete in one, two, three, four, five, six remaining holes. We'll put post protectors on those poles tomorrow and install those posts. After that, it's purlins, and we start working our way up the walls. Last little bit here while I'm thinking about it. These boards, most people call them furring strips. I'm from New England, I call them strapping. I'm on my third and fourth use, I believe, of this same three bundles of strapping. Uh, I've used it in this case around the perimeter as a guide for these six posts I just mentioned, and I use them as diagonal braces because I don't want these posts to twist, and turn, and move as they start to dry out now that they're out of the stack. That's it for day two. Day three comes up. Well, let's see, one, two, tomorrow! Just a quick detail about how we're setting the posts. I set my brace last night between the end posts. It was <sighs> little cattywampus, string is always straight. So trucker's hitch and bowling knots to freeze that. Then we get the post plumb in parallel with each other based on the string location. Stake the brace and move on. I'm gonna have to pivot. Like pivot. This. You have to come back. Pivot. 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 More pivoting. I guess we got it set up so all the dirt falls in the hole. That's cool. That's all right. I want to dig it again anyway. One tip for setting post plumb is you get it on the line and then instead of bear hugging it and muscling it, a little leverage, the digging bar at the bottom of the hole will help get your plumb. So we got that, we'll draw it to the string. How's it look? That looks good in that direction. Good in that direction. Freeze it with some screws. Oh look, my impact driver's right here. <laughs> then, to keep the template from moving while we backfill the holes, a couple stakes. Now we're ready to backfill and strip the template. Perlins, this is what I'm calling them. I'm sure pole barn builders call them something else, but why would I get busy researching what they call them? 
What we're doing here is we're laddering every two feet with horizontal two by fours. We've got our first sight set. We're just gonna match this angle. Then we're gonna level across because our skirt board is not level. It follows grade. Fourth width. So we'll go here. Get flushy McFlush flush. Pack it. Pop it. Now crackle. Nail off, rinse, repeat. Every two feet, all the way up. The level's upside down. I see that. <laughs> God damn it. Oh look, he was two miles out because of that. Just like that. Perlins! Oh, cheese and rice. Who cut this royal? You have to put a block in there. Nope. Good. Beginning of day three. We snapped out the roof pitch at the end of yesterday, day two. And now we're just gonna take the circular saw and cut along the lines we snapped to give ourselves a one in 12 pitch on this shed roof. I'll cut these all on this side, I'll transfer the line around, cut them all on the back side. Uh, uh, oh, e, uh, woe is me. thing we've decided to do is let in a pocket or a shoulder cut on the tops of our beams five inches down from the high side that matches our roof pitch and we're gonna let in a ledger sort of like a balloon frame detail. Now all I needed to do is get up there. Uh, let's try it this way. Reset the saw to an inch and a half. Depth of cut. Boom. And I can see the line. We'll work our way around the building. Get all these shoulder cuts cut out at once. Okay. So. In this comedy of errors, we're doing the first rafter set. We've got common rafters on the right side, a double common rafter set on the left side, and a common rafter on the left side. We're using the center as a double beam, and we're gonna run purlin rafters between the two before we sheet the roof. That's what we're doing right now. We also discovered, as we were setting our rafters, that a generous overhang here of 34? 34. 34 plus the sub fascia, which will make it 35 and a half. Minus the siding. Minus the siding and all that. There's other math. Do you mind? I'm in the middle of the tape. Anyway, <laughs> that's what we're doing. Maybe you should send it over this way. <sighs> And just to overmake the point, we set the two end rafters, much like deck building, 
to the desired overhang. We ran a string between them. Now we're just gonna set these with our plum cut already made in place. We're gonna bomb them in with a couple of three, number 10 by three fasteners. Right now, today, at some point in my lifetime. That sounds good. It's also worth noting that we crowned these before selecting where to make the bevel cut. Plum cut. I mean plum cut. Oh no, it's raining a little. Got it. We'll add blocking, then we'll start the left and right purlin rafters. Let's go. Using strapping again, the same pieces from those same three bundles that I started out the job with. As a cleat to hold my subfascia. The subfascia has an overhang of seven inches this way, and I'm bringing it to the center of the center rafter set that way. The strapping. Doesn't take a day off. Now, having crowned this two by six, I can get my nail gun. Then I'll remove the strapping, like this. Mud in here is like a Monty Python skit from the meaning of life. That's another story. That's it for the end of day three. Summary, we figured out all our purlins and posts. There was a detail that got away from us, but that's okay. We added a ledger cleat, otherwise known as a Yankee cleat for our purlin rafters. We got subfascia in, we got lookouts in, we got the first rafter in, repeat on the back, and tomorrow, by the way, all of this light, single source light, is one Metabo HPT work light. I'm super impressed. I'm also super tired and don't want to digress too much, but there it is, right there. So, for what that's worth, we begin day four tomorrow of our horse barn, pole barn, horse stall project. God, I'm tired. Bye. See you tomorrow. Woohoo! When you're running a crack, roofing operation like this one you don't want to waste any motion so all we do is put a piece up find out it doesn't fit take it down cut it put it back up and try again i mean that's pretty efficient that's the way to do it Our main carrying beam, lookouts, overhang. We gotta do subfascia right, subfascia left, some blocking in the back. And this is gonna start looking like a roof system. Giddy up, people, giddy up. See, that's the horse theme. I'm a storyteller, Tim. Oh my God. That's why I say stuff like, giddy up. It's the only one I can think of, by the way. Do people say that? Nay! <laughs> Things I should have thought about earlier, a little bit more, even though we're close, is when I designed this roof frame, I should have thought a little bit more about staying in a four foot matrix. I'm 98% in it, but I added subfascia to the low end, I added subfascia to the high end, so we're a little off. However, most of it's laid out at 16 centers so that I can get full support 
for the OSB decking as we go through. To wit, that's me using a nail gun. Fascia time, and we're a little longer than 24 with our overhang. I guess I should have thought about it, but here we are. To get a full piece that way, and a full piece that way, and to give these homeowners a horse shed that is unlike any other in its little trim details, I'm gonna pop in a medallion. Two-piecer, can run our drip edge right over, and it gives it kind of a nice refined look. We're gonna get this piece cut at some point, right? Over here, somewhere at some point. Aye, aye, Captain. <laughs> When I start getting this close to terminating my shingle sets at the front edge of the roof, I'm less concerned with how even I am coming up from there than I am with how even I am finishing out to there. So I'm 49 and a half to here, and I'm 49 and a half to there, which tells me we're running parallel with the front of that, which means my last ripper strippers of shingles will fit just fine. I'll keep an eye on it, but that's what I'm looking for. One thing that differs in a horse stall as compared with, say, a backyard shed or even a pole barn is a horse needs something called ah, kickboards. And they are for what they say in case the horse kicks. Here we're reclaiming the old kickboards from the horse's previous home and we're repurposing them here. And a couple things just to note. We gap them about an inch. They are rough sawn. They're hooked and wanged and so forth. So we're doing our best. But the general gist is we're putting them on vertical two by fours. Tell me that's gonna fit. Come on, baby. If one's wider than another, we just sort of split the difference in the middle. We're looking for about an inch between. like that, and then we'll just tack them. Gun nails, boom, 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 boom. We've got a 12 foot span here. So with eight foot stock, we reclaim from the farm. I've got a nail set over there. I've got a nailer set right here. And generally speaking, I can eyeball that difference. Grab the spiker. I think we're off to the races. Horse stall, pole barn, kickboards. Adding soffit with our heat treated, mill faced, knotty pine, eastern white pine, shiplap, thank you, niece lumber. That fits like a glove, glove, glove. I'm in there like swimwear. And we're just going to tack it. I'm using a narrow crown stapler. He's using a finish nailer. I'm going to come back with the siding nailer and nail it off. But for now, It's day 15 or so on the pole barn horse stall build. Great take, 
Mark. Why don't you put your back to everybody? My guy, guy, my guideline is the top of this purlin, which we put in place earlier. So rather than line up the bottom and thinking I can define everything myself, I'm using this as a guide. Get the get these in place. Narrow crown, baby. Saw an ad somewhere for crown staples today, for a tool that shoots crown staples. All staples have a crown. It's what type of crown they have. How about that for tool trivia? Okay. This piece slots in. We got a little wiggle room. So I'll split a nickel gap here just to overdo the proportion. Yeah, it's a horse stall, but I want it to look nice anyway. I'll come back and I'll nail all this off with the siding nailer. Tack it! That might be it for today. See you tomorrow! I'm flying on a jet plane in the mud. And then these operate like this. Yeah, that's a little snug. Doors need latches, so do shutters. So rather than go the store-bought routine, I just take a couple of pieces of shiplap, a few washer head screws. You don't need to be, but that's my preference. Do a few clip cuts, nothing fancy and a fender washer. We put all that together as yeah. a little latch Tuck this through a little more. Latch with a personal touch. Now, this is the only pole barn in America with this kind of latch. How about that? Costs nothing. Same over here. This is the weatherboard. It's a piece of one by inch and three quarters to the 16 degree bevel off it positioned such that the end grain is protected from upsplash and getting debris in and around and near it. It's a barrier, a border, and a watershed. One of the things I love about working with natural materials like this Eastern White Pine heat treated shiplap is that sometimes it's both the problem and the solution. So the way this all laid out, a full piece of shiplap is gonna come right to the edge of my purlin. It's an ugly detail that I wanna tighten up. So what I do, and I'll do this when I make a door or some other things, is instead of messing around with some goofy detail or trying to add a corner bead, 
I'll just extend my run a little with what I call a transition strip. And all it is, is a piece of shiplap made out of a piece of shiplap. And I'll take it, and I'll tuck it in so I have a generous piece of wood here. So that it looks like it grew there. Then, I've cut this already, I'll take my last piece, I'll tuck this in, in theory, and then my little return back to the building works like a charm. I'll staple that in place, follow it up with the siding nailer. Woohoo! A couple of double two by six brackets with the medallion detail, miter cuts up here, toe screwed, up to the soffit, add a nice look and support for this generous overhang. Love me some pocket screws. Good thing we installed blocking everywhere. Long enough, John? Only about four more tons to go. U-hook, bowling knot, slip knot, little screw here, a stop for the shutter so it can't travel too far past open, a hook that meets our ring, cutching the slip knot travels, I can't do that with one hand, but if we want to snug this up with the slip knot, we could. Same thing over here, reverse order. Unhook, store, close. Asaraita. Here's something particular to a horse stall that's not particular to a pole barn, pole building, or other backyard shed enclosure. And that is a horse or equine specific stall front. Now I didn't know we had to install this until I got here. I don't know anything about having a horse. And I would have shot this because it was an orchestra of coordination. This thing weighs about 500 pounds. Two people can't lift it. So we engineered a system of skids. We had two by eights arrayed, kind of like railroad ties, to get it from where it was stored over there, to bring it in here, to get it in position. I can't say enough about the leverage I got from my nester bars that gave me the leverage I needed, or we needed, to get this thing in position and power lag that puppy in place. And she works a very nice. Uh, 
like that. Stall front. Heavy stuff engineering. Happy to have it in. That's it for me for this chapter of the story. Our pole barn horse stall is built, it's bulletproof, and it's embedded in the ground from post protectors and concrete based footings all the way through our double purland center beam roof system, shiplap, details, stall front, open storage area. It's all here. It all came together. I am super stoked. I hope you got something out of this. I certainly did. What a hoot. Next step, well, we need to bring the tenant home. Ooh.